Hey guys, welcome to the Value Hunt podcast and today I'm so excited to be here with Clay Fink and I bet he's a familiar face to you uh, if you're interested in investing uh, just like me. Uh, so yeah, let's delve into the conversation because I think it will be pretty interesting and I hope it adds value to everyone. Uh, so Clay, why don't you say a couple of words before we jump right into the questions? It's great to be here with you, David. Uh it's great to have the opportunity to chat and get to know you and uh, be on your podcast. Cool, cool. Um, yeah, to be honest, it's uh, it has been a long time since I wanted to have a chat with you because I had the the chance to to talk with Sean uh, from your newsletter, and he's a super nice guy, and he just tells me nice stuff about you all. Uh, and obviously, I I watched uh hours and hours of of your show so yeah i'm i'm really curious to see uh where the conversation goes uh but first of all i would like to ask you a question i ask all my guests which is who is clay yeah so i host a podcast called we study billionaires uh it's been my favorite show ever since i was back in college that would have been you know 8 9 10 years ago uh yeah, so I joined the Investors Podcast in 2021, and then I ended up joining the We Study Billionaire Show in 2022. Um, I love learning. I love connecting with interesting people and generally helping others learn as well, especially about money and investing because it's a topic I'm deeply passionate about. Um, I've always enjoyed math, so diving into my background a little bit, uh, that led me to uh, be an actuary after college. So that for those not familiar, that's really just sort of, uh, the math side of insurance, which is somewhat related to investing. I took a number of exams that are, uh, tie in well with investing. So that kind of helped prepared me for what I'm doing now. Um, when I was on that path, I eventually discovered investing and, uh, discover the investors podcast network and discover, um, you know, Preston and Stig show and really considered them mentors, even as a listener of the show. So it's a lot of fun to have the opportunity to work with them now and see how they run a small organization. And uh, yeah, just working with TIPs led me to work on some really interesting things. I've pr produced a podcast every week since November 2021, done, done cool. a number of YouTube videos that have been well received, um, interviewed many investors I really look up to. And then last year, uh, we launched an investment community under the TIP umbrella that's been going really well and I've had to, the opportunity to meet and interact with some really interesting people uh, who are also listeners of the show. So, um, yeah, I uh, couldn't be more grateful to be a part of the TIP team and uh, look forward to what comes next. Nice, nice. That's that's pretty cool. Uh, and uh, I'm just curious to know a bit more on your, let's say, early stages of development, because I feel like that's the most important part for like building the character of someone. Um, therefore, could you share with us some stories or maybe uh, some passions you had early on uh, besides math that maybe had to do with what you do today? Because uh, yeah, it's uh, even though actuary science is really interconnected with investing, it's still a bit different. Therefore, it would be cool to know um, any stories that are relevant to get you know better. Yeah. So uh, from the very beginning, I was raised in a rural community in the Midwest here. Uh, I've been in the mid Midwest all my life and um, just looking back, I feel incredibly blessed and grateful, uh, had a great family growing up, great friends, great little community. Uh, I love sports growing up. So I think a, a lot of investors uh, sort of have this competitiveness to them that, uh, you know, the game of investing, I had one guest tell me it's like the, you know, the, the ultimate competitive sport. Uh, it's like the intellectual Olympics is the way you put it. So, yeah. Yeah, I think uh, every summer you would have found me as a little kid, me and my friends just outside uh, playing basketball uh, or whatnot. And yeah, I think reflecting on my background, it just reminds me of just how lucky I was. You know, all these things that are just outside of our control uh, can sometimes end up playing to our favor. So that really makes me 
uh, really grateful. My parents, they really harped on the importance of school growing up, but especially at an affinity for math. So I cared a lot more about math than a lot of the other subjects. But uh, my dad was a farmer, actually. So I saw, you know, the hard work he had to put in to provide for his family. And I feel like a little bit of that work ethic has been passed down to me. Um, there's so many memories just out on the farm, hot summer days of not knowing when, when we were going to be calling it a day. And, uh, also figured out that the, the farming, that line of work probably wasn't for me. And, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, just, we're going to be talking about humility probably during this conversation, but, uh, yeah, that line of work definitely can make one, uh, humble and then down the actuary route. Uh, so that's what I ended up going down, uh, after high school into college. And then a few years after, after college. And yeah, again, it's, it's a really difficult path because the exams that are required are just really, really difficult. And, uh, yeah, so I, I ended up getting a, my associateship through that route and passed six exams. And, uh, I feel like that really helped develop, uh, intellectually, uh, critical, critical thinking and whatnot. And just, uh, you know, help ingrain that, that work ethic. Cause preparing for these, oftentimes it takes at least three months straight of studying a lot and a lot of memorization and a lot of just reps of understanding all these problems and, uh, how, how they might ask them. So yeah, that, that was really critical in my development. And, uh, you know, it's kind of easy to say that, you know, I, I took all these exams for no reason because I'm not an actuary anymore, but, um, I think that was also part of what helped me, uh, be in the role I am today, um, with TIP. Cool. That's, that's really interesting. I, I don't know if it's okay, but I would like to go into some tangents here because I'm just curious about what you just told us. And, um, one of them is actually, I'm curious to know what your parents think about your job. Like you work at a podcast network. I believe their, their life was much more traditional uh, in terms of running a farm and so on. So how, <laughs> how does that happen? And like, how did you explain to your parents that, oh, I look at, I, I work at this podcast network? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, I was working the job as an actuary and I told them about it. And neither of them have probably ever listened to a podcast. So it's like the first question is what what's a podcast? And um, they they were supportive in the transition, but also pretty skeptical, uh, you know, letting go of this <laughs> this really safe, safe, secure job like the actuary route. One of the appealing things about it is like the employment rate is like ninety nine mm -hmm. or one hundred percent. Like like if you have your credentials like odds are you're going to be employed in this industry yeah. and there's great benefits, there's great salary and whatnot. Uh, but ultimately I just decided over the long run, it wasn't kind of what I wanted to, the path I didn't want to be on. It didn't suit kind of what I valued or figured out that I valued in a, in a line of work. So yeah, again, they were, they were super supportive and, uh, it took some time for them to sort of come around to, um, sort of what this job offers, you know, it was easy for me as a fan of the show to see the opportunities and see what, what this sort of opportunity could bring with CIP. Um, yeah. So, uh, three years in now, uh, I think it's safe to say that it was the right move from, from my perspective, but yeah, I mean, um, at the end of the day, it was, it was my decision. Um, I dealt with the consequences of whatever that decision, uh, uh, led to. And, you know, I just said at the end of the day, if it just happens to somehow not work out or I don't like podcasting or, or whatever happens, I get let go, whatever it is, then, um, like I said, the employment rate in the <laughs> actuarial field is pretty much a hundred percent. So, uh, yeah. I would worst case scenario, I'd be in the exact same position that I was, uh, before. Yeah, exactly. And you still had your credentials. So that's, uh, that's always a plan B, I would say. Um, but I, I think it worked out all right. So, uh, <laughs> that, that was, a a good choice in hindsight. And like, why don't you tell us a bit more on how you actually got into TIP? Because 
uh, it's a big way uh, between uh, like listening to a show you really like and actually working there. So uh, get us through the process of becoming a member of TIP. Yeah. So when I was at my previous job, uh, I was actually on my vacation with my family uh, down at the lake and I got an email in my inbox from uh, TIP letting me know that they were hiring for their millennial investing show. So I was just on their email list uh, with mm -hmm. thousands of other people. And initially I really thought nothing of it just because um, to be honest, like I'm a pretty introverted person, which would surprise people mm -hmm. because I, I host a show mm -hmm. and like have this public uh, personality and whatnot. But um, I think it was that day, one of my good friends texts me and he's like, Hey, you should apply to this. And, you know, initially I was like, you're crazy, man. And then <laughs> I thought, I thought about, I thought about it a little bit and I'm like, you know what, maybe I should apply to this. And, you know, just thinking, why not throw that your hat in the rink and just see, see what it might lead to. Yeah. So I applied, it ended up that there were over a hundred other applicants and luckily, wow. lucky enough it, yeah, they had a few rounds of calls and interviews and whatnot. And you had, um, submit um, me asking questions and come up with questions for sp specific guests and vet vet uh, some guests they sent. So there's quite a process to applying. And then, um, yeah, I mean, I, like I mentioned, I knew I didn't want to be in the actuarial field long term. Um, I, I thought I wanted to get into the investing space in some capacity. And then uh, once I got that acceptance email from Robert Leonard, um, I knew that I just couldn't say no. So I <laughs> left the safe cushy <laughs> job with all the great benefits, uh, to work with, uh, to be honest, a fairly established podcasting company. Like I think a yeah. lot of people, when they hear podcasts, it's like this, this company probably makes no money, but <laughs> it's certainly not the mm -hmm. case with, with TIP. They're fairly established in, uh, in, in the podcasting space, have a pretty big listenership. So, um, I know some people just thought I was crazy and, uh, yeah, I mean, it was a night and day transition, to be honest, in terms of the work environment, the type of work, yeah. uh, you know, really everything. But it's been such a blessing for me and really changed everything. So I'm really glad that I ended up making the jump. Yeah, that's that's so amazing. I, I can only imagine like your day to day job being talking with investors and learning and so on. Obviously, I'm aware that there's a lot of work that goes behind the scenes that we don't see. Um, but, uh, I, I'm really curious to know what insights and in which ways did talking with these high quality individuals and investors, uh, make your life better. And what did you learn, uh, from these high quality conversations? Yeah. So Charlie Munger once said that those who keep learning will keep rising in life. And that's really what the podcast is all about is helping me continue to learn and become a better version, uh, helping the audience become a better version of themselves, um, especially those in the value investing community. So people talk a lot about compounding money, but what probably isn't talked about enough is compounding knowledge. So to touch on a few of the things I've learned, I think the first thing I would say is I've learned just how difficult stock picking can be. Uh, and obviously the show, we talk about stock picking a lot. And it's easy to think that anyone can go out and pick the next winner, build a solid portfolio, but really it's incredibly difficult to do. And, you know, I've chatted with and analyzed countless investors, their backgrounds, their holdings, their returns. And it, one thing that's amazed me is just how, how many managers out there underperform the market. Um, you know, yeah. it's common knowledge that many manager, most managers do underperform, but you know, when you actually look at all these investors, it's, it's really true. You know, they've, they sound great. They've read all the books, they've done the research, they know their companies well, but they still underperform the market and, you know, just mm -hmm. sort of a, a humbling thing to, to realize. But with that said, I think that many people also assume that to be a great investor, you have to be good at picking these winners and avoiding the losers, which is partially true. But I think it's also important to know that uh, what Peter Lynch shared is that you can bat 50% and still go down in the investment hall of fame. So the reason is that the stock market offers this positive asymmetry. So while the average stock offers a negative return, 
it's the best of the best that are going to double, then double again, then double again, and maybe even double a fourth or fifth time. So you might lose all your money on one company or maybe have a few really poor investments, but just one or two picks can really um, carry your portfolio. So definitely not an easy thing to do, but the positive asymmetry, I think, is really important to understand and um, I think helps me uh, try and just have that longer term mindset where, you know, in order to have these big winners, you need to be able to, to stick with them even then when it's maybe difficult to do so. And one of the cool things about being a host on the show is that I can talk to all these interesting people and just take the parts from them that I find to be most valuable and apply to me. So in a lot of Monish's talks, he, he discusses the power of cloning and jokes that he's never had a single original idea uh, that he's ever come up with. And I know you're familiar with this as well. So, you know, why should we come up with all these great ideas when ourselves, when we can chat with people much brighter, much smarter than us that yeah, have already sure. sort of figured it out. So Monish, for example, saw that he could gain a massive advantage by stealing the best ideas from the smartest people he could find. Uh, mainly Buffett and Munger is the people he sort of looked up to. So there was a small, very small percentage of people. Uh, he, he actually claimed to be master cloners that essentially ran and owned the world. So he talks about how most of the value creation at Microsoft were things that they copied from others. So you look at Lotus mm -hmm. and they, they looked at Lotus and they created Excel. They looked at word perfect and created word. They looked at the Mac and created windows. Really the list goes on. So yeah, S Sam Walton and Jim Senegal are also great examples of master cloners. And, you know, I, I shamelessly clone ideas from investors and people that are way smarter than me. And it's, uh, I, I believe it served me well, uh, so far. And to be clear, this isn't my way of saying that we should just, you know, find a great investor and just buy any stock that they buy. I think that's a, also a recipe for disaster. So really what I've tried to do in addition to just educating the audience through these interviews and episodes is, uh, also tr trying to find these ideas that I can implement into my own process. So one example is putting a big emphasis on business quality. So if you're going to be buying and holding, uh, these companies for many years. Um, I personally want to try and find the best of the best of the best. So companies that generate a lot of cash, high return on capital, you all, you won't know all these things, uh, tuning into my interviews, you know, growing market share, strong competitive advantages. Uh, and I think great businesses bought at a good price have the potential to compound your money for a really long time, oftentimes longer than many people might think. One other thing I took away from Ian Castle was just the value of relationships and the value of networking. So great investors yeah. really surround themselves with people that can help them get to the truth, oftentimes the truth of a company or the truth of a stock really quickly. And that's something that I think is really difficult for a lot of uh, investors because we're all busy and in that networking process, you need to be quite proactive in connecting with others and you're doing exactly what Ian said uh, that he recommended people do is just, you know, putting yourself out there, starting a blog, starting a podcast and uh, letting people see you and see your potential. So especially when you're just getting started, networking with others can be really powerful in your development as an investor. And it's certainly been helpful for me uh, learning and sharing in public. And um, one thing is when I, when I get something wrong, sharing in public, I, I usually hear about it qu pretty quickly. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> That's right. Um, yeah, so many interesting things. I don't even know where to go, but, uh, I, I just wanted to add a quick note on what you just said of putting yourself out there. I think it's one of the most powerful forms of leverage uh, that we have available right now. Um, because just like you can leverage uh, your your job to get access to these really interesting people, uh, I myself, which I'm just an 18 year old kid, kid out of Portugal that basically knows 1% of 1% of what you know or or uh, any other of my guests know 
uh, it's it's really a good way to 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 accelerate your learning curve, so to speak. So yeah, I I'm not encouraging everyone to to let's say start a blog or a podcast because it takes commitment and it's a lot of work. Uh, but if you're really into it, I think it's a really good way to 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 boost your knowledge and compound it quicker. So yeah, uh, kudos to you for, for doing that at a very high level. <laughs> but uh, what I'm more curious about is actually uh, how, how do you get access to this really busy and uh, let's say uh, very interesting people that most of the times uh, already have like a hundred people in their inbox trying to reach out to them. So I, I'm I'm aware that you might leverage TIP's name, but still, how do you get access to to these kinds of these kind of guests? I wish I had a magic formula for you, but <laughs> uh, I'd say one one thing is really just the reps. So for every high quality guest I get, I might have five people that told me no. So, or just ignored me. So yeah, it's definitely not easy to get, uh, some of the big name guests. Uh, we've developed relationships with a number of, of people that just enjoy coming on the show. Um, yeah. So as you mentioned, TIP's reputation certainly helps. I think that's probably one of the biggest factors though. Um, I typically try and make my pitches short and sweet to them and outline what TIP offers that maybe other podcasts mm -hmm. don't. Um, so we've had many big names on the show previously. We've had over 150 million downloads since inception. And I've chatted with a number of other big names. So I think that can sort of add to my credibility or just add to TIP's credibility, just saying, hey, like all these other names have been on the show. And it uh, sort of makes it easy for them to say yes or no if it's of interest to them. So yeah, one of the things about podcasting really is once you get some of those big names under your belt, it gives you that credibility and gives you that leverage to get other big names in it. Also signals in a pitch that uh, you've you've done the work, so there's proof of work there. And I also think that how long your podcast has been around has been a signal too. So TIP has been around since 2014. And uh, yeah. I don't know the exact numbers, but I'd say most podcasts probably quit or stop after one or two years. So if you can last longer than say two years, it, I think it signals to a lot of people that uh, you're taking it a lot more seriously than, than most other people. And, you know, I've seen some podcasts do three or five episodes and then they'd realize how hard it is to get a listener or, yeah. you know, gain a following or whatnot. So they just, they just quit. Yeah. Uh, for sure. I think, uh, just like, uh, Ian Castle says, uh, turning the most rocks is uh, most of the time the best way to find, uh, the diamonds or the gems or whatever. So, uh, I think that's, that's about right. And, uh, um, I, I was just curious to learn from the master of the game, uh, who gets all these cool guests, but yeah, I guess it's, uh, it's a lot of building goodwill over time and being patient uh so that's the main lesson i took from what you said and i don't know if i i i got it wrong but i hope uh, not yeah you certainly um, did yeah, yeah i think you certainly did i mean uh i i think a podcast is like anything like like it, you you have to put in the work you have to have patience and you just have to uh let it take time you know like the great things aren't going to happen overnight like as with investing or as really with anything so um as as you're sort of as someone's name as someone's you know reputation builds then over time that that goodwill builds that you mentioned mm -hmm. yeah um that's that's really interesting because i was just wondering what did you what do you do the rest of the week when you are not recording. So I bet there's, uh, as I mentioned, as I mentioned previously, a lot of uh, work with, that we don't see. Uh, so uh, how does your day look like in a normal day, so to speak? Yeah, there really isn't a normal day, <laughs> but a lot of my, a lot of my weeks look fairly similar. So uh, the easiest way to sort of put it is half my time is probably spent on 
producing a weekly episode, whether that be uh, prepping my own script and just chatting myself on the podcast or prepping for an interview. So a lot of yesterday, for example, um, I did a recording and I was reading uh, a guest book that he wrote. Um, so yeah, I was reading that book to prep for the interview. So mm-hmm. yeah, about half my time is spent on the episode, you know, preparing, recording, post editing work and whatnot. And then the other half really is on, uh, kind of managing and growing our investment community that we have. It's called the TIP mastermind community. So we have around 120 ish members of that group, uh, global. So all big fans of the show and value investors. A lot of them are uh, equity analysts or portfolio managers or private investors. Yeah. So really serious investors. So in that we do a bunch of things. So we host uh, weekly live zoom calls. Um, We have an online forum where we're sharing ideas and connecting with people. And uh, I hop on calls with, with each member. So I I've gotten to know uh, each person in the group. And then uh, we have two live events each year. So we're uh, prepping to go to New York city here in October. So I'm, I'm uh, managing that and getting getting everyone together there. So we'll we'll have around. Uh, not not all members will go, just a, a portion of them. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Sounds like sounds like fun. Like uh, preparing um, for the interviews and really uh, having a forcing function, just like Jake Taylor says, uh, to really learn about this uh, guest exactly. you're going to talk to talk with to. I don't know, maybe ask one or two questions that are really differentiated from what everyone else does. And uh, yeah, I think that's the the value added component of your episodes and your show. So yeah, uh, that's that's really interesting. And uh, I'm 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 curious to know, like um, you talked with, uh, for example, names like Chris Mayer, Ian Cassell, but also uh, people that think more deeply about finance in a general way. So like Morgan Housel, uh, which has written one of the best books uh, in the in the last uh, 10 years uh, about uh, money and the psychology behind money. So I was wondering, what's the utility of money uh, for you? And what have you learned from your guests on, on that topic? Yeah, that's a, it's a tough question. So since I was younger, to be honest, I was highly motivated by money, but my thoughts on money and my view on money has really changed quite a bit over the years, which I think is natural for most people as they, uh, gain more life experience. So my first job out of school, um, one of the big reasons I pursued that career, uh, was because of the money that it offered. And I feel like I discounted too much sort of the other aspects of that line of work. And when I transitioned to TIP, I initially took a substantial pay cut, knowing that long term, you know, I sort of wanted the best of both worlds. So, you know, an, an income that I, a level of income that I wanted, but then other these other things. So like work I find engaging and an entrepreneurial environment and great coworkers, a flexible work schedule, all these things. Uh, that I realized I, I also valued in addition, in addition to money. So that's a little bit about how I view work in general. And, uh, I think it's the investing side of money is really important. So, um, I definitely love investing, but I I just think it's, uh, investing is almost an opportunity that I think a lot of people maybe underestimate. So, you know, I believe in basic money saving principles that Morgan Housel shares, like spend less than you make, invest a good portion of your income. And I've seen just the benefits myself just in the past 10 years or so. And and I believe that compounding just gets better with time since it's back end loaded. So, um, I, I sort of have a sense of, I feel a sense of obligation to try and help shed that light to others. And I, uh, want to help other people realize the power of long-term investing. And, um, it's part of what drives me to do interviews like this. And many people, I think view investing as something that's, uh, super complex, super confusing or similar to gambling. And I feel that part of my job is just to try and shed that, that value investing line of thinking. Another reason I'm really driven, uh, just to learn more about investing and, um, try and 
help educate people is that uh, I think many people just haven't realized how much uh, purchasing power has been lost uh, in the U.S. dollar here in the U.S. at least over the past, say, five to 10 years. And, um, you know, a lot of people look at like the inflation uh, numbers that the government shares, but they don't look at the inflation of things they're actually buying. So things like a house, education, the cost of living in general. So a good standard of living is becoming more and more difficult for especially the younger di- generations. And I feel like a sense of obligation to try and help bring awareness to that, that issue as well. So investing so far, um, you know, you not only want to achieve just like some sort of rate of return on your investments, but you want to compare that to uh, things you want to purchase. So if you haven't purchased the house yet, you want to look at how much housing has gone up. So uh, one of my episodes, I shared uh, an example of how much housing has moved in uh, my area. So I looked at January 2020 and January 2024, the average single family home in my town increased by 37%. Um, so that's something I look at when I'm judging the performance of my own portfolio because I want my purchasing power not just to, or I, I want the value of my portfolio not just to go up, but to exceed um, the things I want to be able to purchase in the future. So I feel like that's that's really important too. And I think it's another way of just helping sh- show people the importance of investing because if you're not keeping pace uh, with the things that essentially with your cost of living, then uh, then you're essentially just falling behind or just treading water depending on uh, anyone's particular situation. Yeah, that's that's funny that you say that because I actually started investing because I learned that there was this thing that was like eating your money secretly and uh, it was called inflation and uh, I was like, "Oh no, I'm I'm losing money by by doing nothing with my money." And uh, before I I just thought, "Okay, if I save, I I don't know, all the Christmas money and so on, uh I'll I'll stack a good amount of money and I'll I'll be fine." But uh, yeah, uh, fortunately, I, I I I learned that early on, and uh, yeah, it has been the main driver for me wanting to learn about investing and so on. So, yeah, it's a noble um, cause uh, to fight for, and I'd say outside of the US, and even in the US, there's a big lack of financial literacy and uh, basic knowledge about finance, and. Uh, yeah, whenever I'm doing a video, I'm just thinking when it's more simple stuff, obviously, if I'm analyzing a company, uh, it will be a bit more complex. But when I'm doing a general video, I'm just saying, like, what would my friends uh, like to learn that they don't know? So, um, yeah, I think uh, it's uh, it's uh, it's a great purpose to have uh, in this in this field. Um, yeah. So thank you for for your answer. It was uh, really insightful. Mm, I I I also want to to understand a bit better how you incorporate all the investing styles you interact with because um, you mentioned before that you try to clone but as you said if you just clone without really thinking about what you are cloning you you end up um, maybe using an investing style that doesn't fit your lifestyle. Uh, for example, you run, you, you are pretty busy uh, just by doing the TIP work. So I, I, I understand why you focus on higher quality companies that want, that you want to compound for a very long time. Maybe you have to do a lot of uh, upfront work, but uh, there is very little maintenance with high quality businesses. So I, I was wondering, how do you think about incorporating all these lessons and uh, really uh, what pieces you took from each investor? Maybe you could also provide examples uh, to to give a clearer picture. Yeah, I mean, you've really hit the nail on the head of, <laughs> you know, being being busy uh, with work and whatnot. So, uh, frankly, I don't want to spend, you know, my entire days, uh, analyzing new companies to add to my portfolio. So when it comes to the stock market, I'm really just wanting to be a buy and hold stock picker of high quality companies. So one of the filters I use is would I be comfortable owning this name for the next 10 years? And I wouldn't be able to sell. 
So obviously, you know, I might change my mind on a company, but uh, I want to buy something hoping that um, I'm able to hold it for the next 10 years and, uh, you know, earn a earn a satisfactory return. So personally, I've implemented a lot of Chris Mayer's approach to investing. So uh, listeners are welcome to check out uh, the few interviews I've done with him. I've picked up a few of the names he owns, and then I have a few small other smaller names that uh, aren't in his portfolio, but have very similar characteristics. And I also resonate with um, sort of your your comment and the way Morgan Housel thinks about investing. So he sort of put it to me that you know he wants to invest in a manner that allows him to focus on what he's really good at. So. And he doesn't want to analyze 10Ks, for example, and such. So he he primarily invests in index funds. But, you know, because of this, I want something that's relatively easy for me to understand. And especially, essentially partnering with management teams, I can put a lot of trust in. So like you said, doing a lot of that work up front and then just light monitoring of the companies over time. So I think some... Some investors call these sleep well stocks, and I really like uh, that that sort of framework. I think uh, two of the b- best examples I've found so far would be Constellation Software and Hermes are probably the best sleep well stocks I've found. I actually don't own Hermes, but um, I'm actually uh, doing a deep dive on it with Shreva's when often here, here soon on the show. Um, so I just have a pretty high degree of certainty that management of those companies are going to continue to execute and be very good stewards of capital. And then other names, unfortunately, uh, might not play out as well as you'd like, but, uh, you know, I'm willing to hang on to those and see, you know, how things continue to develop. Some of these smaller companies, you have to be willing to maybe put up with some sub subpar quarters or years just cause they're earlier in their journey and, uh, maybe face a more difficult environment or, more difficult competitive threats and whatnot. So I feel like I have a long-term bias. I I like to think I have a long-term bias. So I'm typically not interested in something just because it's cheap because there's an opportunity cost to my time. So time spent researching a name I I might own for three months is time. Otherwise that I could have spent, you know, working on the podcast, researching another quality company or maybe just time spent relaxing and just taking a little bit of a, of a break. So we we all have to discover our own investment philosophy, something that aligns with um, our goals, uh, our temperament, and what's what sort of returns we need to get uh, personally. So we all have to draw the line somewhere of what our own personal investment philosophy is and uh, understand the things that we don't want to spend time on. Cause there's going to be plenty of opportunities that come up that might not align with your philosophy. Yeah. I, I deeply resonate with what you said. Um, especially since uh, being a student, uh, like it or not takes a lot of time if you want to do it well. Uh, so it's, it's a bit like a job I would say. Um, and therefore I also really like, these high quality businesses, but I'm also aware that I'm very young and uh, if I'm able to compound capital at higher rates, uh, probably with smaller micro cap stocks, um, that's also a smart thing to do. So I wanted to get your feedback on this, but I'm currently trying to blend a bit of the two ways of thinking. Partially because I have a lot of mentors that have pushed me for the past two years or so to invest more in micro caps. They even gave me this cup. I don't know if it can focus, but it basically has this micro cap investor uh, yeah. making fun of uh, the the golf player. But anyways, uh, uh, I'm I'm currently looking at having so like six really high quality names and then maybe four to three micro caps that I can uh, see that there's, um, let's say, more midterm uh, upside, uh, which, which I can forecast better because as you get into 10 years, 20 years, I mean, it's it's really hard to, to put a, a really precise forecast on it. I would say impossible, especially if you read um, Super Forecasters. 
I think, um, yeah, you, you, you get a pretty good idea of how hard it is to forecast. So, yeah, I, I just wanted to know whether, let's say, a uh, Ian Cassell flavor mixed with a Chris Mayer flavor sounds good to you. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, <clears throat> I totally understand uh, where you're coming from. Uh, my co-host, Kyle Grieve, uh, actually takes a very similar approach. So he owns something like, if I had to guess... Sim very similar to the numbers you said, like something like mm -hmm. six or so, what he calls stalwarts, where uh, he can put a lot of uh, confidence on their growth. And then he has, um, you know, f four or five or so uh, nano caps or micro caps that he calls inflection point businesses. So oftentimes these mm -hmm. are on the brink of profitability. And once the market realizes uh, the value creation at play, uh, there's a lot of potential upside. Um, so generally he puts a shorter leash on those companies. So if they have a quarter or two of misses, then he's really not, uh, not hesitant to maybe let those go. Uh, whereas if yeah. a stalwart has one or two misses, it's like, yeah, eventually they're going to get back on track because he's built that trust exactly. with the management team and their track record and whatnot. Yeah. So I think from it, I think it's cool. You're sort of exploring, uh, the, these other investing approaches, but uh, from my perspective, I think the smaller companies, um, I think they can be difficult to really get to know. Um, they oftentimes don't have as long of a track record uh, to look at. So um, maybe your confidence level on some of these names uh, is difficult to get a to get a grasp on. And uh, they require probably more monitoring. And uh, I would yeah. say some of them might potentially be more difficult to really get familiar with because if, uh, there, if there's no analyst coverage, um, if, unless you're reaching out and talking to the managers yourself, uh, it might be difficult to really understand the industry, understand the business, uh, outside of just reading their reports. Um, yeah. And maybe like one or two people do a write up on the company, but, uh, you might become biased just based on whatever research they've put out and kind of, you know, put confidence in their word, even though it might not, not necessarily be right. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, to my knowledge, uh, Kyle's had a lot of success with the nano cap approach to, to this. I know there might be one or two where, uh, they sort of been blunders, but others have gone up over a hundred percent in like three or six months or something. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I mean, uh, it's, uh, I think it's, if that's something you're interested in, then, uh, definitely could be worth exploring because I think micro and nano caps definitely, they most likely have some of the biggest mispricings in the market, yeah. uh, in, in the near term, at least. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So the, the, the thing I've noticed is that you, I believe you learn more with micro caps because you have to do all the heavy lifting yourself. So I've invested in one, um, actually two, but uh, I sold one. Um, and I've invested in one out of Australia. And so I've been trying to reach out to employees, competitors, the management, uh, like basically everyone. No one has got back to me, but uh, hopefully that will change in the near future. Um, but other than that, I'm just really do, using alternative ways to research. So really using much more LinkedIn, much more like Google search and, uh, even chat GPT to get a, a feel of how the operations actually run. And so I think it's also cool from that side, probably over time, it will prove to be a waste of time. I don't know. Uh, but, um, yeah, I'm having fun. I'm on vacation too. So that's why I'm, I got more interested in that. Probably once I start university, I'll be, um, a bit more, more reluctant to, to put in, uh, so many hours, but yeah, let's see how it goes. I, I will update you on, on this strategy. And if I find any good names, uh, I'll tell you too. So yeah. Uh, also one, one other thing is that, you, if you look into these really small companies, it's really rare, but you can get a case where you ride up the the wave of becoming a high quality compounder. So, for example, um, I know you you guys interviewed Paul Andriola. Uh, I think it was Kyle 
who interviewed him and uh, he he found out about expel which was like a uh 150 bagger or 1000 bagger or something like that um but and like this company is really high quality and he found out about it when it was really really small so you probably will have a lot of turnover uh two three years uh maybe for each uh pick but if you really see that the management is executing you may found find like chris mayer type stocks over the long run and uh, that's also interesting for me i would say yeah uh <clears throat> Yeah, I would just say it's a uh, it, it it like you said it'll take a lot of turning rocks to find yeah. uh, that level of company and I think nowadays just companies the great companies are going public later and at bigger mar market caps. So Expel is based in uh, Canada if I remember right. Or maybe it was a US company but Ca San Canada listing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, maybe it was a Canadian listing or something really weird is, is the way you found it, if I re remember correctly. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I think uh, setting proper expectations is also right, is also good uh, just to help uh, keep that, you know, set the right expectations going into it because it, you know, expels are like sort of the exceptions to, you know, my yeah. Andreola might have reviewed, you know, 2000 companies before he found the expels of the world and uh, yeah, you know, hanging with with that approach too. I think hanging on to it for that long is going to be really difficult. If you're, if you know, you might find another microcap opportunity that looks just so compelling. So you're going to have to to let go of maybe one of your winners, for example. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's that's right. I I I think we we always like um, idealize uh, everything that we find that is new and interesting, but. Um, yeah, thank you for, for your thoughts on this. Uh, I think uh, they were uh, pretty insightful. And uh, I, I really want to dive into this topic uh, because I'm, I'm pretty young. I've never experienced a crisis myself. And uh, I've also never done too much research into the history of financial crisis. And I, I do know that you made a video called Decoding Financial Crisis. And uh, I was wondering whether you could share with us some guiding principles that you learn by doing the research for that video. Yeah, so during that episode, I really chatted about two books. So the first one was titled This Time is Different by Carmen Reinhardt. And then the I also chatted a little bit about Lynn Alden's book, Broken Money. So... I don't typically cover macro on the show and I'm certainly no macro expert, but this was one of the exceptions where I ended up covering um, some of the books that I was looking into on the show. So the biggest takeaway for me was that uh, history shows that when society or countries or governments, when they build up excessive levels of debt, then usually we should act with caution because eventually there's a price to be paid for that debt accumulation. So this is nothing new at all. I mean, people have been calling out the US and other governments for taking on excess debt for many years and uh, the show sort of goes on, but history would suggest that these typically don't end very well. So the reason that the first book is titled This Time is Different is because people have this tendency to believe that financial crises are things that happen to other people in other countries at other times, <laughs> it would never happen to them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So people like to believe that, uh, you know, they're smarter, they do things better. They've learned from past mistakes, but, uh, people tend to forget about the mistakes that were made in the past. And, uh, you see these, there's that saying that history tends to re repeat itself or not. It doesn't repeat itself, but it often rhymes. So this, mm -hmm. this book explains one of the, the big things I sort of picked up is that, when a country crosses a debt to GDP threshold of 100%, then they run a significant risk of default, whether that be outright default, which oftentimes isn't the case if they can create their own currency. So the alternative is essentially inflating their local currency to pay off that debt. So the US, uh, where I'm based, US debt to GDP ratio is currently 121%. So 
essentially one of my big takeaways is that I would expect the U.S. to covertly try and inflate away the debt to try and get it to more manageable levels. So um, I personally want to be pre- potentially be prepared for uh, higher than average levels of inflation, especially in scarce goods and services like homes, education, child care, uh, et cetera. So, yeah, I mean, that's really my big takeaway after going through these two books. I would, after going through them, I would say Lynn Alden's book, Broken Money, is the better macro book of the two. And it really helped me understand sort of the big picture of what's happening and how we as investors can best protect ourselves against a uh, continuous debasement of our currencies. And I think something that's also important is that like, you know, if, if governments just outright said like they want to inflate away uh, their debt, they, they have to do it in a, in a covert manner where they're inflating, they're inflating the currency, but they're, they don't want people to really know about it. So they, can, <laughs> so it's just, uh, <laughs> just, uh, yeah, try and making those debt levels more manageable. And uh, I think after COVID the debt GDP to GDP actually declined because of, uh, you know, all the currency that was created at that time and all the inflation that took place and whatnot. But yeah, again, I'm certainly no macro expert. It's just one of the episodes I ended up covering on the show. Cool. Cool. Uh, yeah, I, I find that really interesting and, um, especially the, um, I would say the more emotional part because I've been working on myself for the last maybe six months or so or so, uh in this project where i try to really distill the key principles for managing our own emotions and i feel like a crisis or financial crisis or seeing your portfolio decline by say 60 percent is a big test and a big moment to apply these principles and therefore i i would like to know your thoughts on how to manage your emotions during a crisis and in general during the whole investment process yeah, so Aswat de Motoran has spoken extensively about having an investment philosophy that you can really stick to. So, you know, part of my investment philosophy is to own the high quality businesses that we talked about and own them for the long run. So going in, you have to know that there are going to be periods where things don't necessarily go your way. And, you know, you shouldn't be surprised when that happens, essentially, because if you set the proper expectations going in, then uh, you can be prepared when uh, things turn against you. So I also think having a support network can be helpful as well in helping one endure through those difficult periods. And that way you can hear different perspectives and maybe adjust your approach if necessary. And you're sort of all in it together. So I speak with uh, Kyle and Stig, for example, quite often and members of our community and uh, you know, a lot of us own some of the same names, so that can be helpful as well. And, uh, part of being a good investor is really sticking to that philosophy. So if you're constantly switching between investment strategies, then you're bound to probably not do, do very well because you're letting your emotions play too big of a role in your approach. So the human psychology piece that you mentioned is really important to understand because, we're all biased, whether, whether we realize it or not. And I see, you know, a lot of people get excited about things just because the price is going up or they get fearful because the price is going down. So it's really important to focus on the underlying fundamentals and not let the share price cloud our judgments. And then, uh, I think taking advantage of the greed and the fear in the market can really be quite advantageous because it can help us avoid buying when things are on the pricier side. And, and then, uh, hopefully take advantage of the opportunities when share prices fall excessively. So sticking to the investment philosophy and sticking to the game you're playing and not letting others or not letting the market sway your opinion too much is really critical because uh, one of the things guests mentioned on the show a lot is uh, how share prices fluctuate much more than fundamentals. Uh, So oftentimes with a lot of companies, you see the DV, the DV, share price variance in one year might be 50%. So if the average is a hundred, you know, it might go between 125 and 75, but that underlying fundamentals typically 
can't fluctuate that much within just one year. It's yeah. just the narrative and the in the story people are willing to believe about that company that's that's really changing. So um thankfully Mr. Market uh moves things <laughs> uh quite a lot and I don't believe markets are all all that efficient at, at certain points in time. And uh we as investors can try and take advantage of that from time to time. Nice, nice. Yeah, I I always find those insights especially fascinating um, because it touches upon the that point where investing actually teaches you about life itself and human nature. And so uh, for me, it's, it's very interesting. And to speak about declining prices and market movements, uh, I know you you own or I believe you owned uh, Dino Polska. Um, which is a pretty interesting business out of Poland. And uh, it actually declined 10% uh, this morning at opening and or, or more. But uh, yeah, I'm just curious to know uh, what you think it is the destination for that business and uh, really um, how much... Uh, confidence do you have in their growth prospects over the the long run? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So as you mentioned, the day we're recording here, share prices are down nine or 10%. We're sitting at around 312 Polish lotty. And I do own shares in Dino. I initiated my position uh, the fall of 2023. And uh, yeah, after going through the, they just did released earnings yesterday. So um yeah, it's, I personally think it's quite a low valuation. It's like the lowest valuation on a PE basis uh, ever since they IPO'd in 2017, if, I, if I'm if i looking at it correctly. So um, I guess I'll also say I'm very biased because I own, uh, own shares. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I took a look at the report and they're certainly going through a difficult uh, macro environment in Poland. So they're seeing increased... Uh, pressure from competitors from a pricing standpoint. Uh, f food inflation is down significantly, so that's that's led to slower growth. Uh, it's actually bordering deflation, and uh, I'd expect eventually for that to turn. So Dino, they reported like-for-like uh, -like sales. It's a key metric to sort of look at how they're performing. So for this quarter, it was around 2%, and their main competitor, Vidranka, uh, reported negative 4%. Uh, so they're from an operational standpoint, they seem to be weathering through better than Bidranka. Uh, and uh, Dino's clearly the better business in my view, but they do also have a uh, stiff competition. And, uh, I should mention over time, they've continued to steal share from these mom and pop grocers. And I expect that to continue as they continue their expansion. So when looking at, uh, destination analysis, uh, Dino today has around 2,500 stores in the past 10 years, they've opened, uh, roughly 2000 stores. So the majority of those have come over the past 10 years and, uh, they've con continued to add more distribution centers. So last time I checked, they were look working on opening up four of them and each distribution center can support around 350 to 400, uh, Dino stores. So this year they actually opened up their ninth distribution center. So from my point of view, I think management sees a lot of opportunity to continue to open new stores. And, you know, that's sort of the the thesis with Dino is uh, reinvesting 100% of earnings and uh, continuing that store growth. And that store growth has slowed down over the past year. And uh, they've strengthened their balance sheet, pay down some debt, but I, I personally expect that to pick back up. So Dino expects to open 270 stores uh, this year, 350 in 2025, and then more in the years that follow. So that would bring the store count well no north of 4,000 five years from now, um, up from 2,500. And uh, yeah, it's difficult to say, you know, how confident I am in that. Um, as to what could prevent them from doing it, I think a new entrant might be able to potentially slow them down, but they wouldn't be able to scale near as fast 
as Dino, just because of how big they are and how much cash they have to, to deploy. Um, maybe their expansion into East Poland isn't as successful as it, as it is in the West. And, uh, you know, maybe that stiff competition continues. Um, but, uh, I don't see the store growth. Uh, I, I see that continuing over time. And, um, I have a lot of faith in management's ability to expand because they've just been so successful with it over the past 10 years. And, uh, yeah, I think management is really just really good at allocating capital and uh, they've implemented this playbook for 10 years. And, uh, you know, I think they really have it figured out so they know where the best spots are to place new stores and get a solid return. And, you know, if one town if one town doesn't show a lot of promise, then they're going to be looking elsewhere. And, uh, you know, they have their hurdle rates they're looking to hit and uh they have a lot of capital to build out in a lot of these towns. So if new uh, competition starts to come in, uh, maybe they'll be uh, building elsewhere. Uh, I think they have a lot of uh, expertise in, in hitting their returns. And, I, and to my knowledge, they haven't closed a single store of the 2,500 they've opened. So there's been a pretty good success rate on their expansion. And based on what I've seen, if they're able to reaccelerate that store experience, Expansion in the coming quarters, I would expect earnings to reaccelerate and the market's going to change their opinion on the company. Uh, so right now, I think investors are sort of running for the hills in, in light of the, the slower growth, the tough environment, the higher pricing pressures. And uh, yeah, I mean, it, it is a tough 2024 for them. And uh, Poland also recently had a substantial minimum wage increase that's put pressure on margins across the industry. And uh Personally, I think today's share price uh, is a pretty good opportunity to get a great company at a fair price, uh, and that's assuming they're able to to execute over the long term. So, if you're looking to get a short term gain, uh, I wouldn't be too hopeful with that. But uh, yeah, I'm willing to give it time and see how it plays out. Yeah, we should also mention that there is a lot of capex being spent on building this new meat plant that um, because I, I'm assuming people already are a bit familiar with Dino, so I'm not uh, going to explain the, the whole thing. But yeah, they, they are basically spending a lot of uh, on growing the business and really the back end of the business, I would say, because store count is what people usually look at and that has slowed down. But since they have been paying that and uh, investing in infrastructure, I don't think they are dumb uh, in that sense, looking at the track record. And also, I think this is the only billion dollar, dollar company or really, for that matter, any company I've seen in the public markets that operates with no CEO, uh, which in reality is not really true. It's just uh, formality because... I think the chairman is really taking the shots there and they have a, a board of three people, uh, which is also peculiar, but they, they seem to be pretty competent. So yeah, uh, I, I think we, we should talk, I would say five years from now and really uh, do a post-mortem or uh, uh, say how how good we were to, to spot this uh, at the right time. I, I would say... Being a contrarian uh, is one of the easiest but hardest. I would, no, it's one of the simplest but hardest ways to to generate alpha, because uh, it's just so unnatural to to do what others are running from. Um, so yeah, if people want to learn more about Dino, I would highly recommend watching your video with Kyle. Um, it's, it's really insightful. You, you get a pretty general and good idea of, uh, of uh, what Dino does and how they operate and the opportunity, uh, set, uh, for the future. Um, so yeah, I highly encourage the listeners to do that. And, uh, if you are okay, uh, I would only... Uh, end this with a fire round, which is basically, I I say a sentence or three sentences actually, and you have to give a short but quick answer, and uh, yeah, that's that's a good way to wrap this up, I would say. Sounds good. Cool, cool. So my first one is 
the most impressive conversation you've had with an investor? Uh, from, from my perspective? Yeah. Hmm. Let's see. Most impressive. Um, one I'm most proud of is probably Morgan Housel. Okay, cool. Um, then I would like to know any other passion outside investing. Or your biggest passion outside investing. Hmm. Yeah, I would just say uh, I really enjoy staying active. So lifting weights, getting outside, running, uh, just generally being active. I love playing basketball. So uh, yeah, every day I'm I'm doing something. So and that's sort of the way it's been ever since <laughs> I was a kid. So uh, just love being active and uh, uh, moving my body and kind of get a break from the, the all the screens we look at nowadays. Cool. And the last one is the book that's most changed your life. That's a great question. Looking over at my bookshelf now. Um, <laughs> I would say from an investing standpoint, either the two that definitely come to mind are Hunter Baggers and the Joys of Compounding. Both hugely impacted me and uh, were very instrumental in sort of how I think about investing in the world. Perfect. Uh, great, great picks. I, I love those two. And yeah, if uh, there is nothing else, I would just ask you to tell the viewers where they can find you and your work, uh, which is really amazing. And yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, well, thanks for having me, David. Uh, this is this is fun and uh, really got me thinking on on some things and which is always a good time. So to find me, you can just search the investors podcast or we study billionaires um, should be simple to find. And, uh, yeah, we're on all podcast apps. We're on YouTube. Uh, we have a website with a ton of different resources there. And, uh, you can find me on Twitter as well at clay underscore Fink. And, uh, yeah, feel free to reach out uh, if you'd like to connect. Cool. Amazing. So see you next time. Thank you, David.